There is a measure in economics called labour productivity. This is a really important statistic because it tells us a lot about how any particular economy functions and perhaps more importantly, what it values. Remember, above all else, economics is a study of how people interact with things of value. So what labour productivity measures is the amount of output generated for every hour of work done in a particular nation. It's a pretty simple figure to work out so long as you have the data. It's just national GDP divided by total hours worked in a given year in a given country. But what it tells us is truly remarkable. Workers today are amongst the hardest worked individuals in history while simultaneously being the most efficient. Now sure, they have traded in gruelling factory floors and coal mines for air conditioned offices so they probably don't have quite as much sympathy as their industrial revolution contemporaries but the world today is marred by different challenges. Hustle culture and the glorification of roles like surgeons, investment bankers and corporate lawyers have set a precedent of on call all the time under the guise of professionalism or being a team player. Expectations and key performance indicators are increasingly monitored, scrutinised and increased year on year. Now the discussion around overworking is not a new one, but it tends to focus on the mental health implications of this reality rather than the economic impacts. Now we are going to be leaving that health discussion to the side for this video and just focus on the economics of the overworked world. Partially this is because there are many people far more qualified to talk about mental health and partially because well, sometimes for things to get changed it needs to make economic sense for them to be changed. So health implications of 100 hour work weeks aside, we really only need to answer one question in this video. Does people working longer and harder make for a more prosperous economy? Yep, that's right. We can be a society of the most miserable and overworked shells of human beings imaginable and it likely won't change if the answer to that question is yes. It's economics that got us into this mess, so maybe it's economics that will get us out. The video you're watching right now would not have been possible if it wasn't for our amazing sponsor, Acorns. An investment app that automatically rounds up your credit and debit card purchases to the nearest whole dollar and then auto invests the spare change for you into a diversified portfolio. Sign up now by going to acorns.com ee or click the link in the video description below and Acorns will deposit $5 into your account to help you get started. That's acorns.com ee. Now if you are watching this video while at work and hoping that it will vindicate you putting your feet up for the rest of the day while working from home, you might leave a little bit disappointed. Work is very important, both on an individual level in the sense that it provides income to maintain a quality of life, but also on a national level because it provides the amenities that we in the modern world have come to expect. This goes all the way down to what we would consider essentials. You turn on a tap and water comes out. Flip on a switch and the lights go on. Go to the shops and there will be food available to buy. And well, all of these services are the result of massive supply chains full of people that are putting in a lot of effort. This hopefully shouldn't come as a huge surprise to anyone watching, especially those viewers from developed countries where these things are almost considered a given. But that actually might be part of the problem here. We have entered the age of entitlement. If we were to look back to the early 1900s, we would start to see a world somewhat resembling our own in the modern day. For the first time in history, nations such as the United States were seeing more people living in urban environments rather than in the country. The driving force behind this was jobs. Good paying jobs with defined benefits and expectations. This new reality, where people would work for a large company rather than for themselves or another family on a farm, brought with it some pretty big perks. For starters, these kinds of jobs normally paid pretty well. What's more is that the income was a lot more predictable. A family working on their own farm may be financially ruined after a few bad seasons that was outside of their control. Whereas even if a factory workers company went out of business, they could likely find work in another factory across the street, which for a lot of families was a really big deal. Now the trade off of this stability was marginal utility, which sounds weird, but let me explain. The productive capacity of a farm is ultimately dictated by the amount of land and the quality of that land. 
Once crops are planted and maintained, there is not much marginal utility to any additional hour of work. We explored this in our video on do we need a 40 hour work week, which also looks at some insights that we won't have time to explore in this video. But in general, a farmer putting in 100 hours a week is not going to make corn grow any faster or a cow make any more milk. So in a sense, their best economic approach is to put in the bare minimum effort while maintaining a healthy harvest. And again, this is not to say that farmers don't work hard. They definitely, definitely do. Probably harder than I could ever imagine sitting here in my lovely air conditioned office. It's just that their outcomes are not directly determined by the hours that they put in. Factory workers on the other hand, were. A factory worker mounting gearboxes in a Ford Model T could produce more cars in a 12 hour shift than they could in a 6 hour shift because their output was almost directly proportional to their time on task. Because of this, the average worker in the US at this time was pulling in over 60 hours a week. Now remember, this figure was an average. There were still non-production workers and for every one of those individuals who was only working 40 hours a week, there was someone else out there working 80 hours a week to maintain this average. This all started to drop though very suddenly over the course of just two and a half decades. Between the years of 1913 and 1938, the average working hours in the US dropped from 58 hours a week to just 37 hours a week, lower than they are even today. Now there were of course a lot of world events in this time period. The end of World War I, the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression, just to name a few. It would be foolish to say that these events didn't have some impact on these working arrangements, but there was something more and something much more significant. Industrial capital was starting to become the centerpiece of business. Look at a factory from the early 1900s and then look at a factory from the 1930s and then look at a car factory from today. The common theme is that there was less and less workers using more and more machinery. The Ford Model T was built with hand tools, the Ford Mainline was built with heavy machinery and the Ford F-150 barely has any actual hands touch it the entire way through its assembly. This was great because using machinery meant that workers could do the work of many men in the same amount of hours. This was why workers were able to lose 20 hours per week while still increasing GDP during these decades. At this time, people were starting to contemplate a future where workers would only need to be on the job 10 hours a week if they needed to go in at all. People were speculating over a time where all the needs of man would be provided by technology and in many ways, we are here today. But of course, the dream of a leisure lifestyle did not come with it. The first big hiccup was World War II, which more so than any other war in history was a battle of industrial potential. Mechanised warfare was the name of the game and he who had the most tanks and planes and ships would surely be victorious. This did two things. For starters, it introduced women to the workforce in a big way. While the men were off fighting, the women of the warring nations would be responsible for a lot of the assembly jobs that were previously conducted by men. The second thing it did was put a lot of pressure on people to work more and more. It was no longer a matter of producing cars for families, it was producing tanks for soldiers, who would legitimately be fighting for their way of life. Putting in some extra overtime for Uncle Sam was far more compelling than putting in overtime for Henry Ford. We can see the impact of the war very visually on this chart, but after all was said and done, things never really went back to normal. The average working hours of the average full-time worker has never been as low as they were in the later half of the 1930s despite leaps and bounds in technology. Why? Because America entered the golden age of entitled capitalism. The 1950s and 60s saw massive increases in living standards for average American families. People went from living in the cities to living in the suburbs with big blocks and a car or two, but along with this came a loss of free time. Suddenly, getting to work involved a commute, which added hours to the working day without actually adding hours to the working day. What's more is that businesses that wanted to cater to this new class of middle income consumers had to work around their new schedule, which meant being open on weekends or later at night. Some of you watching may be able to remember a time back when shops were not open on Sundays or if they were they would be closed by 1pm. 
If a customer facing business tried to do this today, they would be driven out by more flexible competitors very quickly. Now, this expanded time frame had a trickle on impact for everybody. A standard nine to five middle manager type might get calls from weekend operations during their off days to tell them of some kind of incident and suddenly they are firing up the laptop at 3 p.m. on a Saturday to get everything sorted so it doesn't blow up over the weekend. Sound familiar? To many people, it won't. If they work in roles completely removed from any type of customer service, but we have ultimately become a society that is obsessed with same day shipping, 24 hour opening times and the customer is always right. Part of the reason we have become so obsessed with this type of flexibility is because we need to get things done now because we don't have free time in our calendar until two weeks from now. Of course, entitled consumers are not the sole reason for our overworked reality. That technical capital, you know those machines that were supposed to make us so efficient at our work that we only needed to put in 10 hours of work a week? Well, it certainly did get a lot better. We got amazing technology that meant that we could produce things almost from scratch with no human intervention. But we also got a lot of technology that was better at making sure that we were always available to answer an urgent call, send a quick email, or be there to solve an issue that just can't wait until Monday. Now, a lot of people will rightfully look at this chart and say, ah, eh, well, you know, sure, we aren't living in some dream world of 10 hour working weeks, but it's still certainly not as bad as back in the day when people were putting in 60 hours around the clock on some production line, and they would probably be right. We are better off today than we were 100 years ago. Yippee. But this all ignores one other thing. Today, everybody is putting in their hours. In 1960, around 25% of households were dual income, and this was primarily comprised of younger couples just starting out. Of course, exceptions existed, but it was rare. Compare this to today, where over 60% of households have two income earners and the core of the problem starts to come to light. Not only are we slowly working more and more hours year on year, but more of our hours are not being reported. And what hours we do have left after commuting are then being used on household chores because the prevalence of a dedicated homemaker has fallen into serious decline. The standard 40 hour working week was designed to have five days with eight hours of work. Those working days would be split in three, eight hours at work, eight hours to sleep and eight hours for leisure. Not quite the 10 hour working week utopia we were promised, but when you throw in a two day weekend that was all yours, it wasn't half bad. Today, this looks more like nine hours at work, two hours commuting, two hours helping out another working partner with household chores, four hours of free time, and seven hours of sleep. All topped off by some weekends where that iPhone might go off with a workplace emergency at any time. This breakdown might even be overly optimistic. A 2003 study found that full-time working Americans had an average of three hours of free time in a given day. That was including weekends, of which only about one and a half hours was continuous and uninterrupted. All right, all right, so more people are working more hours and they are available for more hours beyond that. To accommodate this more in-demand world, businesses have become more available to work around people's busy schedules that were made so busy by accommodating to an increasingly in-demand world. Great. This also says nothing of the other pressures like globalization and the increased cost of living. But here's the thing though, does that even matter? Is the fact that people are working longer hours with less free time actually bad for the economy? Sure, we probably all know it isn't great for our sanity, but on a macro level, let's look at this like cold hearted economists. What are those hours worth? If we look at annual labour hour figures for OECD nations, we will find an odd correlation. The nations with the lowest annual working hours are the wealthiest per capita. Germany is a great example of this. It is the wealthiest nation in Europe, but the average working time of its labour force participants are only 1363 hours per year. This is a pretty similar story in places like the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway who all put in less than 1500 hours per year. Compare that to the US with 1783 hours a year or the real workaholics in Greece, Korea and Mexico who are putting in over 2000 hours per worker per year. 
So it is pretty obvious to see that there is a negative correlation between working hours and wealth, but the golden rule of statistics is that correlation doesn't equal causation, so what would really be causing this? Maybe these countries can get away with working less because they're already rich. Well, Germany seems like the market leader here, so let's start with them. In Germany, you go to work to work. Lunch breaks are short, team bonding exercises are almost non-existent, and once you clock off, you are out of there. This is well documented to be the result of their non-customer centric business culture. A lot of tourists are quite surprised when travelling in Germany to find that hotels and shops don't have the same kind of flexibility they might have in the US. That's because the customer is seen as an equal and not something to be put on a pedestal. The same kind of attitude is held with working overtime, where putting in extra hours is not seen as a sign of commitment to your work, but rather a sign of inefficiency. Now this has some really big benefits. For starters, workers in Germany produce more output even with their reduced working weeks. That's because their roles are normally strictly defined and closely monitored for output. If you want to impress your boss in Germany, you work more efficiently. You don't do it by answering text messages on a Sunday. This also leaves more time in the day for other endeavours. Now you might think this is as simple as just getting some extra education to make workers even more efficient, but Germany actually falls behind on that one as well. Only 33% of German workers aged between 25 and 35 have a form of tertiary education. This is well behind the OECD average of 44.9%. So, what gives here? Despite being less educated and working less hours, these countries are still better off than their overworked peers. Well here's the deal. Free time is really important for a few key reasons. For starters, it gives people time to shop. Even if those shops don't bend and scrape to accommodate the customer in every way, that is fine because people are not having to bend and scrape to accommodate their workplace. In a consumer driven economy, this is a really big deal. The second big win is that it avoids slack labour. We explored this in our video on the 40 hour work week, but most roles in the modern world today should be based on output and results rather than time in a chair. Letting people work towards results means that they might be able to pick up a second job where they can again work to achieve results rather than working to the beat of a clock. Even if they don't feel like working a second job, they will be far more refreshed and efficient when they do get back to their desks on any given day because they haven't been worked half to death. Remember that labour productivity measure from the beginning of the video? It was a measure of output over hours worked. A nation is going to do much better on this metric if the hours that are being worked are being worked by well rested and results driven workers. And this hints nicely at the final big win for more leisure time in a society. It gives people the opportunity for entrepreneurship. One of the biggest hurdles for most people starting a business is finding the time to do it. A lot of people don't have the luxury of quitting their day jobs and losing regular income while trying to get some business off the ground. So potential million dollar ideas get lost when people don't have the capacity to make them a reality. An easy example is something like this YouTube channel. I am sure a lot of you watching probably have ideas for videos of your own, but many of those will go unrealised because making videos takes a lot of time and effort that people in modern professional roles don't have to spare. Now obviously, a single YouTube channel isn't going to change the world, but enough people working on passion projects is going to yield some very exciting results. Go and watch our video on why Sweden, a country that is probably better known for its strong social policies, is actually one of the world's biggest hotbeds for entrepreneurship to find out more about that. Work is very important, and until the robot revolution comes, it will continue to be important. But as with all good things, it is best used in moderation. We have fallen into the trap of chasing the last hours of free time in our lives. Has this made us richer? Well, we have become richer while doing it, but the statistics are starting to tell a different story. As for the solution, well, it's a difficult thing to walk back on. No business wants to be the first to shut off their phones to customers on the weekend, and while we are locked in that stalemate, 
everybody is living in a world where we are at least partially on call 24-7. On an individual level, if you really want to fight the good fight, consider setting aside a day per week, like Sunday, where you don't buy anything. It probably won't do much individually, but if we slowly challenge the idea that we have the right to buy at any given time, we might be all better off for it. Of course, when you do make purchases, you should make sure you are getting the most out of them. And you can do this with Acorns. Acorns is your all-in-one financial services app that makes investing as easy as spending. Every time you use your debit or credit card, Acorns will automatically round up your purchase to the nearest dollar and set aside the spare change for you into a diversified portfolio. And naturally you might be thinking to yourself, well, rounding up a couple of cents here and there isn't going to amount to anything meaningful, right? Well, not so fast. Consider this. The average Acorns user invests more than $30 a month through roundups, which if you extrapolate equates to around $360 per year. Now let's assume that you didn't start investing at age 11 like Warren Buffett, but instead you were 25 years old at the time of watching this video and you're finally ready to commit to becoming a long-term investor. By setting aside just $30 a month into a diversified portfolio, which for this hypothetical example grows at 7% per year, you'd have a whopping $79,406.91 by the time you reach retirement at age 65. That's extremely impressive for money that you probably won't even realise is missing. Who again said that rounding up coins would not amount to much? Here's something even more mind-blowing. You can accelerate the wonders of compound interest by using a tool like Acorn's automatic recurring contributions feature. By investing just an extra $5 a day into this hypothetical portfolio, which is easily doable by foregoing your daily Starbucks venti mocha whatever, you'd have a grand total of $476,441.46 by the time you retire at age 65. If you're thinking now, well that's all great Mr Economics explained, but I'm not 25 years old and I don't have 40 years to invest. Let this video now remind you of that ancient Chinese proverb. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Sign up today at acorns.com ee and acorns will deposit $5 into your portfolio to help you get started. That's acorns.com ee. The link is on screen now and in the video description below. Thanks for watching guys, bye.